All right. This morning we're going to talk about the sacrifice of thanksgiving. So you can go ahead and turn to Leviticus chapter 7. Start out in the Old Testament. Um, the word thanksgiving appears 28 times in the Bible. And uh, as I was saying back with the Halloween message, Christmas does not appear in the Bible, the word Christmas. And uh, that's a whole other study. But Easter appears one time in Acts 12.4. It's in reference to a pagan holiday celebrated by Herod. Uh, but the Bible does mention Thanksgiving. Now, it's not an actual holiday per se, but it is. Uh, there is a, a thing there about Thanksgiving. Um, now, before we read this, I just want to do a, uh, just a quick history of the American holiday of Thanksgiving. Um, basically, the very first time that a day was set aside as a day of Thanksgiving, an official government-sanctioned day, was in 1863 by Abraham Lincoln. Um, but it didn't actually become a federal holiday until 1941. But it's interesting to study the, the earliest roots of this celebration. Um, of course, most people know that the first Thanksgiving was basically the pilgrims at Plymouth, you know, and, and that whole thing. Uh, but that happened in the year of 1621 at the Plymouth Plantation, where the Plymouth settlers held a harvest feast after a successful growing season. And that's that is the story that most of us have in our minds of the first Thanksgiving when the Indians came and, you know, they helped the pilgrims because they were, they didn't have much food and it was a new country and, and everything. And they, you know, celebrated this time together. Um, but from the very beginning, now I'm not going to read all these different articles, but, uh, in the Plymouth tradition, it says here, a Thanksgiving Day was a church observance rather than a feast day. When they said, let's have a day of Thanksgiving, there was food there. there. They would have a celebration with eating, but it was mainly a day where they would thank God for their provisions. That's what it was about. And it was not the secular government that was doing it. It was the church that was saying, let's have a day of Thanksgiving. Um, but it was interesting here to read this just to get, kind of give you an insight into our government uh, that we used to have. We don't anymore. But uh, the first national proclamation of Thanksgiving was given by the Continental Congress in 1777. Now, you know, listen to this and imagine this coming from our, our government today. For as much as it is the indispensable duty of all men to adore the superintending providence of Almighty God, to acknowledge with gratitude their obligation to him for benefits received, and to implore such farther blessing as they stand in need of, and it having been and, and it having pleased him in his abundant mercy, not only to continue to us the innumerable bounties of his common providence, but also to smile upon us in the prosecution of a just and necessary war for the defense and establishment of our unalienable rights and liberties, particularly in that he hath been pleased in so great a measure to prosper the means used for the support of our troops and to crown our arms with most signal success. It is therefore recommended to the legislative or executive powers of these United States to set apart Thursday, the 18th day of December next, for solemn thanksgiving and praise. So you have December was when this first one happened here, uh, the first one in the new nation of America that at one time and with one voice the good people may express the grateful feelings of their hearts and consecrate themselves to the service of their divine benefactor and that together with their sincere acknowledgments and offerings they may join the penitent confession of their manifold sins. Hmm. Imagine Congress writing that. Uh, whereby they had forfeited every favor and their humble and earnest supplication that it may please God through the merits of Jesus Christ, mercifully to forgive and blot them out of remembrance, that it may please him graciously to afford his blessing on the governments of these states respectively, and prosper the public counsel of the whole, to inspire our commanders both by land and sea, and all under them, 
with that wisdom and fortitude which may render them fit instruments under the providence of Almighty God to secure for these United States the greatest of all human blessings, independence and peace, that it may please him to prosper the trade and manufactures of the people and the labor of the husbandmen, that our land may yield its increase, to take schools and seminaries of education so necessary for cultivating the principles of true liberty, virtue and piety, under his, under his nurturing hand, and to prosper the means of religion for the promotion and enlargement of that kingdom which consisteth in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And it is further recommended that servile labor and such recreation as, though at other times innocent, may be unbecoming the purpose of this appointment, be omitted on so solemn an occasion. Wow. That's from our Congress. <laughs> back in 1777, not today. Um, but then in 1789, uh, there was another, they kind of stopped it there for a couple of years, but 1789 it happened again. Uh, George Washington again proclaimed a Thanksgiving Day in 1795, and it went uh, three years, and then President John Adams declared Thanksgiving in 1798 and 1799. And uh, interesting uh, no Thanksgiving proclamations were made by Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> There's a reason for that, of course. Uh, he was a deist. But uh, anyhow, James Madison renewed the tradition in 1814 and uh, actually declared it twice in 1815. 1858 proclamations appointing a day of Thanksgiving were issued by the governors of 25 states and two territories. Um, but in the middle of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln <clears throat> proclaimed a national Thanksgiving Day to be celebrated on the final Thursday in November of 1863. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing here. I'm just going to read a little bit. He gives a pretty lengthy speech, but he says, No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged, as with one heart and voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States, and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands, to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent uh, Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the inscriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for a national perverseness and disobedience, commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers, sufferers in this lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged, and fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as possible, uh, excuse me, as soon as may be consistent with a divine purpose to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union, in testimony whereof I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed, <clears throat> done at the city of Washington this third day of October in the year of our Lord, 1863, and of the independence of the United States, the 88th. Proclamation of President Abraham Lincoln, October 3rd, 1863. And since 1863, Thanksgiving has happened every year since then. And interestingly, only one president has messed with the date, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And the reason he did it was so that the shops could have more time to promote uh, Christmas. And... Um, they say here that uh, Fred Lazarus Jr., founder of the Federated Department Stores, later known as Macy's, is credited with convincing Roosevelt to push Thanksgiving back a week to expand the shopping season. And, of course, what do we have now? People don't even care about Thanksgiving, but we'll get into that later. Mm -hmm. uh, on December 26th of that year, uh, 1941, President Roosevelt signed the bill for the first time making the date of Thanksgiving a matter of federal law. Uh, <clears throat> so anyhow, that's basically it. There's a little bit more to it, but I'm not going to 
read any more about that. But uh, was America the very the very first to have this time of Thanksgiving? No. We're going to read about it here in Leviticus chapter seven. Leviticus chapter seven verse ten. <clears throat> And here you have the Jews under the law. Okay, that <coughs> the book of Leviticus is, is the laws that were given to the Jews. Leviticus 7.10 And every meat offering mingled with oil and dry shall all the sons of Aaron have, one as much as another. And this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he shall offer unto the Lord. If, if he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil, and unleavened, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour fl fried. Besides the cakes he shall offer for his offering, leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. And of it he shall offer one out of the whole oblation for an heave offering unto the Lord. And it shall be the priest that sprinkleth the blood of the peace offerings. And the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that it is offered. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. So you see that the very, very first time that the word thanksgiving is mentioned, it is in the Old Testament as a Jewish uh, sacrifice, basically. And it is connected with eating. Okay, so turn over to Psalm chapter 26. Or, yeah, chapter 26. Psalm 26. Psalm 26, verse 7. And we're going to see exactly what this thing of thanksgiving is. <clears throat> okay, Psalm 26, 7. I will wash mine hands... Oh no, I'm sorry. I'm up to verse 6. That I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Um, part of what you do when you give thanksgiving to God is you're telling people what he has blessed you with. And that brings glory to God. If you say, oh boy, you know, I worked hard and I got this big house and I got that car out there, you know, and that's, oh, it's just my work and everything. No. See, God doesn't get any glory from that. That's why you should say, you know, God's blessed me with this, God's blessed me with that. Boy, I thank you, Lord, for this and I thank you for that because it brings glory to God. Psalm 50. Psalm 50, verse 14. <clears throat> Psalm 50, verse 14. Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. You know when the most important time for Thanksgiving is? When things are rough. And that's the hardest time to thank God. Because when things are rough, you know, you start to kind of get fearful and, and whatever. You start to fear man. The Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare. You know, you're to fear God. And in that time, if you are thankful to God for the little things, that will bring glory to God. And that's the most important thing. Psalm 69 Psalm 69, verse 29. Psalm 69, verse 29. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Um, part of your praise of God should be singing. That's why it's important to sing when the saints get together. But on, even on a daily basis, the Lord wants to hear us singing. You know, there's, it's kind of like if, I think one of the highest forms of praise that there is is little kids singing to God. You know, I think that that's great. I mean, it's just, you know, it always brings tears to my eyes when I hear little kids singing Jesus loves me or something. I mean, that's wonderful. And I'm sure, you know, it's a great blessing to the Lord. Well, we are his children. So, you know, God doesn't care about how good your voice is. He just wants to hear you singing praises to him. Um, 
And real quick here, I'll, Ephesians 5.19 says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3.16, we're going to look at these later. I'm just going to read them for now. Let the word of God, or let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Okay, so part of our daily praise for the Lord needs to be singing to the Lord. Okay, and, and that's you know a way to show our thanksgiving to Him. Turn to Psalm ninety-five, verse one. Psalm 95, verse 1 and 2. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Okay, that's the only rock that uh, a Christian should have in their lives. The rock of salvation. Okay, but God wants us to be thankful for what we have. And uh, that's very important. Psalm 107. I'm just going to hit a bunch of verses here in Psalms. Psalm 107, verse 21. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Now we're going to get into this thing of the sacrifice of thanksgiving as we go on here. But essentially what a sacrifice is, is it costs you something. You know, And sometimes thanking God for situations in your life is very difficult. You know, And I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. But the Bible says in everything give thanks. Not in every good thing, in everything. And there are some things that happen in your life, and it's really, really tough to think about it in a positive manner. But you have to think, you know, Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for good to them that love God, to them which are the called according to his purpose. Okay, so whatever happens, if you are following the will of the Lord, now if you're sinning and God chastens you, well... You're getting a kicking, and actually that does work together for good too, you know, in reality. But the point is, everything's going to work together for good. You need to be thankful in all things. And especially when times are getting rough, you need to be thankful for that. And that's a sacrifice. Something bad happens in your life, the first thing that should enter into your mind would, would be, you know, I just had a car accident. Well, praise the Lord, I'm not dead, <laughs> you know. I'm going to lose my, you know, everything. The car's not insured or, you know, whatever. Okay, well, God has a purpose for it. I don't know why, but, you know, thank the Lord for it. You know, well, thank you. The ambulance got here on time, you know. <laughs> Just in everything, give thanks. Find something to thank him for. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians 4, verse 15. This is kind of an interesting verse. Second Corinthians 4, 15. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. Now, what's the word redound mean? It basically... If you want to boil it down, it means return. Okay? When you give glory to God, and we're going to see this as we continue, you give glory to God for things that happen in your life, and the unsaved world sees it, and they they look at that and they say, boy, that Christian there, they really went through a hard time, but they're thanking God, and they're giving God the glory. Hmm. That will eventually, that glory will actually return to God. In other words, it might not be that that sinner might not glorify God right at that point, but they will eventually. They'll have to admit, yeah, I did see that Christian thanking you at that point. You know, it will actually come back to God. Philippians 4, verse 6. Uh, 
Okay, okay we're, well, actually, we'll go up to verse 4. Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Uh, okay, now that doesn't mean that you should be clumsy. <laughs> okay, it just means full of care means essentially like worrying. Okay, don't be, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When you pray to God, I actually heard a uh, an old preacher, Walt Ziegler, the one time I have a recording of him, and he said, you know, when you pray, God wants to hear your, he wants to hear confession of sin, but he knows how rotten we are. You know, don't spend too much time on that. Thank him for things. You know, that's important to offer thanksgiving to God, to praise God. Okay, that's that's very important. And you see it right there with everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. What's supplication? Supplication is basically humbling yourself. So there is the thing there of confessing sins. But there's also the thing there of thanksgiving, of giving thanks for what you have. And that's how you're to pray. Supplication, humble yourself. Thank God for what you have, and then make your request known unto God. That's the model right there. And what happens if you do? Well, verse 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, you read these stories about the martyrs and how they're tortured, and they get through it, and you think, how on earth could you do that? You know, it, it passes all understanding. You know, you're getting there, you're being tortured, pain, misery, and yet they still have joy, they still have peace. See? It passes understanding. But that's what you can have as a Christian. And right there it tells you how to get it. Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Okay? Uh, let's see. What's the next thing here? We're going to look at the word thanks next. So turn back to Second Samuel chapter 22 second samuel 22 verse 50 okay second samuel 22 verse 50 therefore i will give thanks unto thee o lord among the heathen and I will sing praises unto thy name. Now that's the first time that the word thanks appears in the Bible. And it's interesting there. It doesn't say, I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the brethren. It's among the heathen. You should never be ashamed to pray for your food and thank God for your food when you're at a restaurant. I mean, don't make a show about it. Don't be a Pharisee. You don't have to, you know, Oh God, thank you. You, know, you don't have to do that. But, you know, Bow your head, pray to the Lord, thank Him for the food. Let the people see it. Don't, you know, kind of hide it or something. Pray among the heathen. Thank the Lord among the heathen. All right, turn over to First Chronicles 16. First Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 8. Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. That's what happens when you thank God and when you glorify God. Uh, verse 9, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name, let the heart of them, that let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done his wonders and the judgments of his mouth okay you're not to just there's no such thing in christianity as okay well i got that covered now i'm done no you're to seek his face continually you're to pray every day you're to read the bible every day you're to sing praises to the lord every day okay and there there again you know i'm going to kick the church movement this whole church building movement it separates 
your spiritual life with your carnal, secular life. It's no longer, you know, because church is a building. That's a place you go on Sunday, you do your thing for the week. You know, if you feel like it, you can come back Wednesday night or whatever. See, it separates it. But it shouldn't be that way. You should be in church 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> because in reality, you are. The church is a living, it's the body of Christ. So, if you're in church all the time, then you should be praying all the time. You should be singing all the time. You should be reading the Bible, you know, within reason. I, I say all the time. I just mean every opportunity that you can. You know, that's important. Now look down at verse 30. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable that it be not moved. Isn't that kind of interesting? What's one of the signs of the last days? Earthquakes in divers places. I found that kind of interesting. We have this incredible increase in earthquakes. I mean, we have earthquakes here in Pennsylvania. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. Whoever heard of earthquakes in Pennsylvania? Yeah, Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. But we're having them a lot, you know. And, and of course, all around the world, there's earthquakes, you know, and major earthquakes. And it's, it's increasing. Why? Because people don't fear God. They don't fear Him. And of course, what's the worst place for earthquakes in all of America? California. <laughs> There's a reason for that. Okay, verse 31. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice, and let men say among the nations, The Lord reigneth. Let me stop there for just a second, too. Remember what I read earlier from our founding fathers? Why did America prosper so much? I mean, other nations have been formed. You have so many different little nations over in Africa coming about, and they aren't blessed. Why? Because they don't, they don't give God the glory. They don't, they don't write tremendous things like our founding fathers did. Our founding fathers, even though some of them were deists and whatever, they understood where blessing comes from. And so they submitted to God and they wrote about God. And they even, in the early years, they even wrote about Jesus Christ. And some of our presidents were definitely Christians, you know, and, and that's why America prospered. But it's interesting because it's kind of like the earth is, I'll just say, almost like a machine. And it doesn't really run right unless the creator of the machine is in control and unless he is being magnified. And we're going to see here in, in just a little bit. And next couple of verses, some very interesting things about uh, the earth. Okay, now let's look at verse 32. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice and all that is therein. Now look at this one, verse 33. Then shall the trees of the woods sing out at the presence of the Lord, because he cometh to judge the earth. That's pretty wild right there. It's going to be pretty amazing when the Creator is actually here on this earth. When Jesus Christ comes back at the second advent and He's here to judge the nations, all creation will respond to Him. Now, I can't understand all of that. I don't know what, you know, trees singing out. I don't know what that's going to be like. I don't know if they'll make a noise or... I don't know. But the point is, the thing that's keeping this earth you know, in chaos is basically, you know, people are not submitting to God. But when he comes down here, everything's going to click. Everything's going to be right at that point. Uh, verse 34. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And say ye, save us, O God, of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name, and glory in thy praise. Now turn to Matthew 15. We're going to look at something interesting here. Some people, of course, they they don't give God thanks. And, you know, they kind of feel like, well, I don't really need to. You know, it's not my thing. I'm not religious or whatever. Well, we're going to see about that. Matthew 15, verse 32. Okay, Matthew 15, verse 32. 
Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, Whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes, and gave thanks, and brake them, and gave to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat, and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat that was left, seven baskets full. And they that did eat were four thousand men, beside women and children. And he went and he sent away the multitude and took ship and came into the coast of Magdala. Now, notice something. Jesus gave thanks. Who did he give thanks to? God. God the Father. Okay, there again, it's important to remember that. We have a mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. When you pray, pray to God the Father. Jesus did not say, Thank you, Jesus, for you pray to God the Father through the name of Jesus Christ. That's very important. It's not that Jesus and God weren't the same. They are. But there is, each member of the Trinity has a different office. God the Father is the one who is the provider. That's why you have the founding fathers recognize that. They were talking about Almighty God. So that's important. But, if Jesus Christ gave thanks to God the Father, why would anybody down here on this earth not want to give thanks? Think about that. I mean, that's that's pretty incredible. Okay, now turn over to Acts chapter 27. We're going to see another time here. Acts 27, verse 34. Oops, next page. Here you have Paul on the ship being basically taken for his trial. Okay, Acts chapter 27, verse 34. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. Yeah, okay, that's it for that verse there. But you see, again, he gives thanks to God. Important to remember that. Ephesians 5, verse 3. Turn there next. Ephesians 5, verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. That's how it should be when saints come together. Now, it's not that the Lord is saying you can't have a sense of humor and you can't, you know, laugh and things like that. He's not saying that. But it's filthiness nor foolish talking, nor jesting, okay, which are not convenient. And it's interesting because I've seen it time and time again. The more jesting, the more foolish talking that you do, it becomes filthier and filthier and filthier. Most comedians, now not anymore, but in the old days, I know Ruckman talked about this, a lot of comedians started out very clean. And as time went by, they got filthier and filthier and filthier. There's something about it. The more you let your mouth talk, the more it will head towards sin. You know, that's why it says back in the book of James about the tongue is a world of iniquity. You know, you have to be careful about that. Uh, the Bible talks too about um, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment, whether it be good or evil. Okay, it's important to include that. It's not just idle words. It's, you know, it, you can speak idle words but you're going to be judged if they're good or evil. But the, the point is here in this passage, as saints, 
I mean, you have to remember that. We're all saints here this morning. It's kind of weird to think about, you know, but we are saints, and our speech should be becoming of a saint. We should be giving thanks to God when we're among each other, because really it's encouraging, too, to thank God for what he's done. Okay, turn over to verse 19, Ephesians 5, 19. We're going to look at in detail here at these other uh, verses about speaking to yourselves. Anyhow, uh, chapter 5, verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts, heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, again, you see it there, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see the mediator thing again there. You pray to God in the name of Jesus Christ. That's important. But you see again the thing of speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now turn over to Colossians 3.15. Colossians 3:15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Again, you see the thing there. Thanks to God, by Jesus Christ. But now I want to point out something here. What's the purpose of singing among Christians? Brings glory to God. What's the purpose of singing in a modern Christian rock concert? Brings glory to the singer. What do they say at the end of the concert? Thank you for coming. Thank you. Good night. Brings glory to them. There's a picture in our local newspaper here, uh, Calvary Church in towards Lancaster City. They had this big concert, and they had, uh, I think it was a band, some band, Jars of Clay or something like that. And, you know, they show the guy up there, and, of course, he's got the microphone, how, you know, the angle and everything like this. And, you know, and they showed out in the, in the crowd. And these people... I'd say half of them <coughs> have digital cameras and they're taking pictures of him. And I thought, yeah, that's the right spirit. That's the right thing. You know, I mean, bowing down to the guy, worshiping the guy. And, you know, I've seen all these pictures. I've been to Christian rock concerts. You know, I was raised in, not raised in it, but I had that thing in my childhood growing up. You know, so it's not, oh, I'm some radical nut that doesn't know what I'm talking about. No, I've been there. I've been to the concerts. And it's idolatry. The people are screaming. They're not screaming praises to God. They're screaming praises to the band, to the singer. They take all that worship on themselves. And it's interesting because a lot of these early Christian rock artists are now secular, and many of them are satanic, to the point where they hate God, they hate Jesus Christ, and they attack him. Many of them are. You know, gee, I wonder why. Well, because they were never saved in the first place. And that's a whole other study. I'm going to do sometime a thing on that. But turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.18. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. I covered this verse earlier, but we're going to look at it now. And this is a tough one. I heard a really good sermon the one time. Oh, I can't think of his name right now. But he did a thing on the will of God. How do you know what the will of God is for your life? And he, this is one of the verses he went over. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And I think he had six or seven points where he went over how to find the will of God. And that's one of them. And it seems very easy. Like I said earlier, oh yeah, I give thanks and everything. But it's not always easy. Sometimes you go through some pretty rough stuff in this life. You're to give thanks for it. You know, and, and it's interesting because you, as you get older, 
you look back on rough things that you went through and you can really sincerely look at it and you can say, boy, I'm thankful for that. I'm glad that that didn't work out back then because where would I be today if it had? <laughs> you know, And that's why, by the way, the, the thing about we covered uh, about the pastors, a pastor should be older. They should not be a novice because a novice doesn't have that experience of life where they can get, they go through those hard times and they can't look back you know like i i said bob jones seniors 13 now what hardships are you going to have you know you're going to preach a sermon about how your mother made you go to bed early the one night i mean come on a 13 year old doesn't have the life experiences they can't talk about i gave thanks you know back then even though i didn't understand it but i understand it now so there's some things that you just have to go through like that. But now finally, let's turn over to 1 Timothy 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to look at where we're at today. I was going down to my friend's house the other night, and uh, I didn't see very many. I think I only saw one house that I can remember that had Christmas decorations out. And today is uh, November the 15th. And I thought, what happened to Thanksgiving? And they're putting it on the radio already. Christmas music and the stores are already putting the Christmas stuff out. Why? Well, let's look at why. First Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. One of the main reasons you shouldn't go to a modern church is because most of them have departed from the faith. And they, it's not just, well, they departed from the faith because they're innocent. They don't know any better. They just are kind of, no, they give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's pretty substantial right there. You want to go to see some devil possession, people possessed with devils, go to church. <laughs> you know, that's what it says right there. They're departing from the faith. See, and study the modern church movement. It's incredible what they get away with. I mean, there's a church up in New York that they, for communion, and I'm serious about this, I even hate saying it, it's just so disgusting. For communion, they serve banana slices and Coca-Cola. They hate Jesus Christ. They can't stand the idea of Jesus Christ. In this same church, I have it in one of my videos, they have this, they call it the Christ, the statue up in the front of the building, and this guy is kind of levitating in front of the cross. And, I mean, it's it's incredible. It's the Antichrist. You know, they're already setting up the image to be worshipped. This big gold man up there, and, and it's not Jesus Christ that they were worshipping in these places. It's amazing. And, and you, you know, you study the thing. They're talking about Jesus is coming, and he's going to bring world peace, and we're all he's going to bring all the religions together, and we're all going to... I'm going to read about that in just a little bit here, too, but anyhow... Verse 2, chapter 4, verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. There is no justification for vegetarianism in the Bible. Now, if you want to do that for a little bit as a purifying thing or whatever, okay, fine. But the point is, God says you can eat the meat and you can eat anything. Now, we're rich here in America, so we have an abundance of things. But if the economy crashes before the rapture, you might have to eat some stuff that normally you wouldn't have eaten. <laughs> and the point is, you thank God for it. You know, I, I mean, I read stories about back in the Depression years, people in the country were eating possum, you know, and 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 the one guy ate some. His grandmother, you know, book I have guy, his grandmother made some for him, and he was like, <laughs> not very tasty. <laughs> it's kind of disgusting, you know, kind of tough meat. But the point is, if it gets bad, you might be surprised at what you'll eat. But the point is, you you thank God for it, okay. We're not under the Levitical law anymore where you can't eat anything that's unclean or, you know, thank God for it. But in the last days, 
there's going to be this thing of people not giving thanks, people saying you're not to eat this, you're not to eat that, and forbidding to marry. That's another thing. Uh, and of course, you have the Catholic uh, priests, which are the, the prime example there, and their conscience is seared with a hot iron, for sure, some of the things that they do. Second Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to look at a couple verses here yet. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, hmm. unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now there's a couple things in there. I mean, that's just perfect commentary on what's going on today. But there's a couple things in there that, that really, I think, kind of show what has happened to this modern Thanksgiving holiday. Okay, first of all, people are not thankful anymore. They're unthankful. It's it, A lot of them are calling it Turkey Day, you know? And it's a time that you get together, and what do you do? Well, yeah, you eat, but watch football. Now, is football wrong? No. Not technically. It's, you know, down here in um, verse 4, it says lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. It doesn't say pleasures are wrong. It just says when it's more than your love for God. Okay, then it is wrong. And that's what this day has turned into. It has turned into this pleasure day where there's no thanksgiving to God anymore. We have abandoned the old ways that were in America of realizing as a nation we are sinners. We need to repent. We need to, to get down on our knees for this day, the whole nation together. I mean, imagine the power of that way back. And I'm sure that there were some that didn't submit to it. But you have a whole nation getting down on their knees and offering up thanksgiving to God. Why has America prospered so much? Because of days like that. Because of that godly heritage. Okay? And that's why the devil is attacking the day of thanksgiving. That's why he's worked so hard to make it into this turkey day, this pleasure thing. And also, now he's just trying to kind of, oh, let's just bypass it. Let's go from Halloween to Christmas, just right over, okay? And, a, and also, by the way, interesting. another interesting side note is most of our holidays coincide with days on the pagan calendar, okay? December 25th is not when Jesus was born. Easter is a pagan celebration originally. Halloween is Samhain. You go down through the pagan calendar, and it's interesting because it'll go six weeks, a day. Seven weeks a day. And you add that up, six and seven is 13. That's a sacred number to the occultist. And they have it all separated out, and it works out almost perfectly to the day that hits all these holidays. But guess what? Thanksgiving does not line up with the pagan calendar. It's a totally separate day. There is no pagan celebration at the end of November. There's nothing there. So, why do you think that they're trying to get rid of the day? That's why. It doesn't line up with the pagan calendar. So if you want a Christian holiday, Thanksgiving is going to be it. You know, I'm not saying you... Some of the brethren, they go off, you know, you shouldn't celebrate hol or, uh, Christmas or Easter. Well, I don't go that far. But the point is, Thanksgiving is a day that has a godly heritage. Okay, it's a very important day. So... That's basically it uh, for this message. As, as we go towards this uh, Thanksgiving holiday, I just want to encourage everybody here and those of you that are listening, I want to encourage you to be thankful and to give thanks. And on the day of Thanksgiving, make sure that you spend some time in prayer and sing some praises to God on that day. You know, be thankful for what you have.
All right, so that's it for that message. Um, I just want to say something else here. I want to. I do want to put this on this with this sermon. Um, I did a message not too long ago about false prophets, and uh, I've been hearing about this thing, and I never really looked into it. I never really checked it out. But this is something that I take very personal. For a, a very, I'm, I'm going to get into it here. How many people here have ever heard of the book called The Shack? Anybody ever heard of it? Well, I had heard that there was this big controversy and people were boycotting. There was a, a Valley Forge Bible College or something like this, and they had this author from The Shack out there to speak. And Christians were flipping out about it, and there was all this anger, and it was kind of like, I should probably study that, but, eh, you know, whatever. It's just another modern Christian book or whatever. Well, here we got this thing from Sandy Cove in the mail. Anybody ever hear of Sandy Cove? I used to go here when I was a little boy with our church. They'd take us down there, and I have very fond memories. I mean, we went a lot growing up. And, uh, you know, I went with my older brother, and we were fishing the one time. It's it's a little resort down on uh, the Chesapeake Bay, I guess. And back in the day, it was little wooden cabins, you know, it was like a little camp meeting. And they had an old wooden barn that you'd go in there and you'd hear a message, you know. And, and uh, we would always, we had to do that. I remember going in there and you'd sit there and they'd preach to you, you know. And then and then after that, you could go fishing, you'd go up, they had a little game room, you'd go up there and play ping pong. And they had a swimming pool. You know, it was just a neat place to go. It was, it was trees and a really beautiful place. And then one time I went down as a teenager with my youth group. I had been gone in a while, you know. we I skipped a couple years and I went down. And we got there and, and all of a sudden it's, it's like this... Because I've had such so many memories as a child at this place. And, you know, all of a sudden the, the place is still there. But this huge building is now right in the middle of this thing. And I'm, you know, and me and my friends were just kind of looking at it like, what is this? You know, and we walked inside and we're looking around and it's mirrored walls and crystal chandeliers and elevators and all this, you know, that rich, stinking con artist, modern Christian atmosphere mm -hmm. where you just feel like, you know, they're, they're going to try and get your money somehow. Right. And, and it was just like, what is this? Where did this come from? You know, this humble little Christian camp, and all of a sudden there's this huge big building. Well, I haven't been there since then, and apparently it's getting a lot worse. And it's just all, you talk about lovers of pleasure, it's all new versions, it's all this rock and roll stuff. They have a seminar in here. Yeah, Worship Arts Technology Summit. How to turn your church and get... The, get the laser lights and the, all the stuff. Yeah, they're having, instead of preaching the gospel to people, oh no, now we have things on how to get, you know, to make it big. Anyway, on the back cover here, it says, uh, interested in hearing the backstory behind the best selling novel, The Shack? During the summer of 2009, we received an amazing gift from Paul Young. His four messages had such a healing and transforming effect on our guests, we have decided to share them. Skeptical? Read what a Bible class Bible teacher wrote after hearing these talks. And here's what the guy says. Whatever I thought about the shack went right up in useless smoke. I am listening to his talks for the second time, and I am thunderstruck by his understanding of grace. you got to watch out for that. That's something that these modern, quote-unquote, Christians are saying about. Oh, grace, grace, grace. Watch out for that. And we're going to see about that in a second. Um, by how the Lord clearly was the one who brought all of this together and how I think I missed the whole point of the story because I was so theological, i.e. critical. Oh boy. I am glad to know the Lord forgives me. Paul's personal story is really a huge picture of the hand of God at work. Now you want to hear what this shack is? This is a man, Michael Yusuf. I guess is his name. Here's He makes um, 13 points, which is a good number for this shack thing. Number one, this is what this guy teaches, this uh, 
William, what's his name? William Young. Okay. Number one, God the Father was crucified with Jesus. Number two, God is limited by his love and cannot practice justice. Number three, on the cross, God forgave all of humanity, whether they repent or not. Some choose a relationship with him, but he forgives them all regardless. Number four, hierarchical structures, whether they are in the church or in the government, are evil. Oh, really? <laughs> Number five, God will never judge people for their sins. Number six, there is not a hierarchical structure in the Godhead, just a circle of unity. We just read about that this morning. Number seven, God submits to human wishes and choices. Yeah, yeah. Rub the magic lamp. Get three wishes. Number eight, justice will never take place because of love. So there's no tribulation, apparently. No judgment of the nations. Number nine, there's no such thing as eternal judgment or torment in hell. Number ten, Jesus is walking with all people and their different journeys to God, and it doesn't matter which way you get to him. Number 11, Jesus is constantly being transformed along with us. Other Christs. Where did I read about that before? Take heed that no man deceive you, for some, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many? Hmm. Uh, number 12, there is no need for faith or reconciliation with God, because everyone will make it to heaven, and number 13, the Bible is not true because it, it, it reduces God to paper. Yeah, it's incredible. And that's what they're having down at this Sandy Cove. I mean, I, it just it blows my mind. It, it has me so ticked off. This place I used to go to as, as a boy, this little Christian camp where they would preach the word. <sighs> Makes me angry. Um... And here's the miserable, wretched apostate, Mark P. Fisher, president and head innovation coach. Mark P. Fisher, yeah. Here he says, I was at a wedding recently. The only people I really knew were the bride and groom. I was in the middle of a playful celebratory moment, savoring two young people, full of love, hope, and joy, when I met a man who said something that stunned me. He introduced himself, said he knew of Sandy Cove, but said he couldn't relate to all the changes. With a very stern expression and somber tone, he said, Mark, I'm a concrete Christian stuck in my ways. I bet you he said a lot more than that. Uh, wow. Ouch. Really? Was he joking? Wait, too much wine? Nope, not at this reception. Nice attitude. Uh, as I cogitate on following Jesus, I think movement, action, seeing Jesus, and, well, following him as he followed his father. When I read in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yep, yesterday and today and forever, I think, yep, he's always on the move. Huh? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, but he's always on the move. Okay? Uh, I long to be with Christ followers, people who view a relationship with Jesus as crossing a starting line, not a finishing line. So let's run. Yeah, you better run. You're going to be running in Revelation 19 crying out for the rocks to fall on you. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Of course he doesn't quote the King James Version, no big surprise. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Well, there's his problem. You know, that's not a finishing line. Well, it doesn't say perfecter, it says finisher of our faith. May we together stay out of the cement, embrace God's loving work in our lives and run with perseverance. So my advice, stay as far away from Sandy Cove as you can. Because it's not run by Christians anymore. That I mean, you, and you go through the pamphlet, and it's just one thing right after another. Incredible, you know. And people saying, "Oh, I sure enjoy it here. It's it's not like going to church, you know." Yeah, it isn't. So that's just my little rant here this morning. So that's it for this morning.